Amazing facts change lives. I'd have to say that I had a wonderful childhood growing up. I went to a private school up until the seventh grade, till junior high. I believe it was at that point in junior high that um, my life began to change. Going from a Christian education into a public school was a big difference. There was a lot of secular influence, uh, peer pressure. And for me, it was the music. I started listening to heavy metal music. Every concert that would come to town, I was there. It had a profound effect on me. I started using marijuana probably at the age of 14. I started drinking, using a lot of cocaine, and that led to methamphetamine, and that completely changed my life. I dropped out of high school my sophomore year and went to work. I would uh, get off of work and we'd go into the bar until two o'clock in the morning and I'd get back up at five and I'd go back at it again six, seven days a week. At the age of 20, I lost my dad to a heart attack. I didn't know how to handle the loss, so I tried to mask my pain with alcohol and drugs. Got three DUIs in one year, was arrested. They gave me a year in the county jail. And the moment I got out, I went back to doing the same thing, hanging with the same people, the same crowd. I was involved in a hit and run motorcycle accident. And I was charged with a felony DUI. Even though at the time of the accident, I was not under the influence, I still had methamphetamine in my system. At my sentencing date, I left the courtroom and I didn't come back. And that left me with a felony warrant. And I had fallen asleep at a, at a park and I woke up to a park ranger knocking on my window. I knew I was wanted, and I knew that I was not gonna just turn myself in. I turned to him and I made the comment, not today, and I took off. I led five different agencies on about a 35 minute chase. And I realized at the point that I wasn't gonna get away and that this was gonna end up either me killing somebody or myself. And so I made a decision to pull over at that point, everything that I had, I lost. I was sentenced to two years in state prison, and it was there that God got a hold of me. And it was through Amazing Facts Ministries. I remember listening on my radio to Pastor Doug Batchelor. I wanted to get to know the Bible. I wanted to know God. And so my aunt, Marilyn, sent me the Amazing Facts study guides. And it was there that my relationship with Christ began. I had called home and I knew my mother wasn't doing well, but I didn't realize that she had cancer. She had about a 30% chance of making it through her surgery. She had told the doctors that she was not gonna have chemo and she was not gonna have radiation, that if her God was gonna save her, then he would save her. I remember hanging up the phone to what I thought was my last conversation with my mom. I turned around, I got down on my knees, and I prayed to God. And I said, God, if you're there, please save my mother. Wherever you lead me in life, whatever you want me to do, I am yours. And I had a feeling of such peace that I knew that my mother was gonna be okay and that my life was gonna change. There are no words that I can adequately express to Amazing Facts and to Pastor Doug to say thank you to all those people who support the ministry. I am a product of your support. My life has changed because of this ministry. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Jesus said that if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. Someone said once, the eye is the window of the soul. Uh, when you talk to a person, you typically look at their eyes. And sometimes we have to tell our children, look at me when I'm talking to you. 
You would never tell a person, please look at my elbow when I'm talking to you, <laughs> because it seems like so much is communicated through the eyes. Eyes are very fascinating to me, how we're able to capture light and images and depth uh, faster than any camera that's been created and uh, transform those things into images and colors and meaning. Someone said once that uh, much as 85% of what comes into your brain every day comes through your eyes. Your eyes are not just physical. You can close your eyes and I can speak words and you have a screen on your minds where you see things. You know what I'm talking about. And you imagine. So the eye is something beyond just the organ. And even as I look at the eyes in the animal world, it's, it's very fascinating the uh, diversity that God has made. You know, the, the eye of a penguin is probably one of the most uh, powerful of any creature. Now, I know eagles can see far, there, but a penguin, when it's there on the ice in the middle of uh, its summer in the uh, Antarctic, it is so bright it would blind any Arctic explorer but the penguin has built in sunglasses where it can dilate its eye to just a pinhole and it can see without any eye damage in the, just the very brightest environment for years. And then that penguin jumps off in the water and you and I need goggles or a mask or as soon as you go into the water you can't see, everything's blurry. But God made the penguin where it's got a built in mask, a special lens that goes over the eye so it can see perfectly in the water. But then the penguin will dive down to over a thousand feet. No diver can go that deep and it can see squid in pitch blackness down there because its pupils will open so much that it can virtually see in the dark. It can go from seeing in almost absolute darkness to being able to see in a brightness that would blind most people. And just think, it only took 50 million years for all of that to evolve. <laughs> just kidding, I don't believe that. You know, uh, one of the favored miracles that I read about in the life and ministry of Jesus is where he opened eyes. Of course, the two blind men here, probably Bartimaeus was one of those. One of the great miracles is where Jesus in John chapter 9, he opens the eyes of a person who had never seen before. They say that, you know, if your sight is not restored by the time you're two or three, that the part of the brain that, that um, processes sight will never operate. And even if you had perfect eyes, you couldn't see because the brain wouldn't know what to do with the images. So the fact that Jesus opened the eyes of this man who had never seen, and just what a miracle that is to finally then look that same day on the face of Jesus, to see the Son of God. You know, we need our eyes open. Paul says we need to be able to see what the world isn't looking at, that we might be able to see the unseen. There's a great story in the Bible I'd like to look at. It's all within one chapter. And if you turn in your Bibles to the second book of Kings, second Kings chapter six, and we'll start with verse eight. Second Kings chapter six, verse eight, and hopefully we will learn how we can have our eyes opened. This story talks about opening eyes and closing eyes and then opening them again. It's a very, very interesting story. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servant, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God, Elisha the prophet, he sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you don't go down to this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told or warned him. And he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. All right, so here's the story. King of Syria, they're worrying with the king of Israel. This had gone on for years. Capital for Israel was Samaria. That was the northern capital for the Israelites, the ten tribes. Syrians up there in Damascus, just like today. They're still fighting, aren't they? And they were at war constantly. And um, so the king of Syria said, well, I'm going to set up an ambush for the king of Israel. And I'm going to set up a camp in this spot. And when he comes down, we'll, we'll overpower him. We'll take him. And Elisha the prophet would send a messenger to the king of Israel and say, you better be careful not to go through this valley or down this road because the king of Syria is set up there to amb ambush you. You know, the secret to a successful battle, most important thing is 
surprise. In a war, the element of surprise. And so uh, the king of Israel would send his spies and they'd come back and say, sure enough, the Syrians are all gathered. They're ready to ambush you. And he wasn't delivered once or twice. That means on several occasions, every time the king of Syria had his secret war room and they'd talk about how they're going to attack the king of Israel, the king of Israel suddenly wouldn't go there anymore. And he was just so flummoxed by all of this. How does the king of Israel always know what I'm up to? Well, the first thing we should be aware of in this story is that you got a war going on, and there's an enemy that is seeking to ambush us. Have you ever been ambushed by the devil? He gets you when you're least expected. Temptation. 1 Peter 5 8 said, Be sober, be vigilant, be on your guard. Because your adversary, the devil, is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. And we all know how lions work. They ambush. Now, lions can't run very long. They can run fast for a short time, but they really depend on sneaking up on the prey and catching them off guard when they're not being watchful. 1 Timothy 3, 7 said, Be careful lest we fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. The devil wants to snare people and tries to catch them. Now how was it the king of Israel was able to avoid these pitfalls? The word of God through Elisha the prophet gave him warning and he listened to the warning. Does God give us warnings in his word to help us avoid being ambushed by the devil? Amen? The word is our weapon. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, one of the important ways that we stay out of trouble is through how we focus our eyes. It's one of the most important things to keep from temptation because it is really hard to resist a temptation you are focused on. The idea is to refocus away from the temptation. I remember growing up uh, in our home, we had a, a dog. He's pretty useless. His name was Zipper. He was a beagle. Uh, but my father and my stepmother just totally spoiled Zipper. He kind of had the run of the house. And, uh, but during dinner time, you know, you tell a dog you're not supposed to beg, but Zipper would sit there at the table and he'd beg. But he did it with a certain amount of self-control. He'd sit there and he'd look at my father. And my father, he'd cut a piece of steak and he'd put it on the ground and he'd say, no, no. And Zipper knew a piece of steak that he would get it eventually. It was on the ground right in front of him, but he'd look at my father, and he knew he couldn't look at the steak. If he looked at the steak, it was over with. And he'd, just, he'd be going like this. And he'd just wait for my father to say, okay, and then he'd look down and he'd gobble it up. Because he knew if he looked at it, he'd have to eat it. And so even instinctively, animals know it is really hard to resist a temptation that you're staring at. The Bible says you're supposed to flee from temptation. So, uh, while we're talking about eyes, remember how important it is to focus in the right direction. So the way that we avoid being ambushed by the devil is through the messengers that come through the word. It was the message of Elisha that said, don't go here, don't go there, and as long as the king listened, he was safe. And our safety depends on heeding the word of the Lord through his prophets and his law. Second Chronicles 20:20. 20, 20, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. Now we don't know where the devil's going to attack us next. Uh, he's sneaky, but we know what the word says about how to avoid temptation. I, I understand reading years ago that people involved in the ancient uh, art of falconry they would take hawks or falcons and they would train them and they, they'd have them hunt small prey for them. And uh, when they'd release them from their wrists, they'd go, they'd start circling looking for prey and pretty soon the falcon or the man on the ground who, who owns these birds, he's looking around, he doesn't know where they are. So he kept another bird called a shrike in a little wooden cage and he would watch the bird because that bird, the hawk or the falcon was a natural enemy of the shrike and wherever that bird was, Wherever the falcon was in the sky, the shrike was always watching him. And so all he had to do was look at the bird and he said, oh, he's over there. He's looking here. He's over here. He's looking. And you know, 
we need that just like extra guidance that God gives us in the Word. If we keep our eyes on Christ, He will keep us from temptation. Why do you think in the Lord's Prayer it says, it's a daily prayer, lead us not into temptation. It says, give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation because we're tempted almost daily. Almost certainly daily, right? Matter of fact, if you don't think you're being tempted daily, you're probably totally lost because you just have not even resisted in a long time. But if you're trying to live a holy life, you'll find all kinds of temptation around you and we need to daily pray for wisdom to avoid it. Now in the Lord's Prayer when it says lead us not into temptation, it's not that God is trying to lead us into temptation. We're really praying Him to lead us away from our natural inclination towards temptation. So the king of Syria, he is just so confounded. How is it that the king of Israel always know, he always knows what our war plans are and what our ambush is going to be. You know, during World War II, the, the Nazi Luftwaffe was coming across the English Channel and hammering England. But that was right about the time that the English developed radar, spelt the same forward and backwards. And the radar would show up, it was pretty primitive, but they could see when a squadron of bombers was coming across the channel, they would send up their forces along with some American planes and they always knew where they were. And then they would do a counterattack to prevent the bombing. And the German high command didn't know about radar yet. They were so sure that they had a traitor on the inside. All kinds of people in their war room were punished and tortured because they said, which one of you is telling them what our plans are? Well, it wasn't any of them. It was that they had developed radar. Well, you know, Elisha had radar. And eventually, one of them said, uh, it says you read here in 2 Kings 6.11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants, his commanders and captains, and said, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? Who's the traitor in our midst? And one of them said, uh, none, my lord, O king. But Elisha, isn't that interesting that uh, the forces of the king were pretty loyal to the king, even though he was the enemy. Sometimes the devil's forces are more loyal than God's. But he said, Elisha the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Now that would make most of us nervous. I was doing some marriage counseling. I could probably share this with you because it was a long time ago and you don't know who it was or where it was. And, and in talking to the couple, uh, there had been an extra marital affair. And the way the wife found out was her husband called one night and said, uh, you know, something came up and work's going to keep me out of town another day. He called from a hotel room. And she just thought something didn't sound right about his voice. And so he went to hang up the phone. This is back in the days when the home, it wasn't a cell phone. You hung up on a regular receiver. He didn't get it all the way in the cradle and it stayed off the hook. And she didn't hang up right away and heard something that no wife would ever want to hear. And if only that husband knew that the words in the bedchamber were being broadcast. <laughs> I've got news for you. There is no thing hidden from God. God knows everything. It says all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we have to do. I remember I was in a small church, Covalo, and we had a very primitive Radio Shack sound system. And it did not have what they call shielded wires. When you have audio wires that go from your amp to your speaker, they're supposed to be shielded. The reason they're shielded is because those wires can end up working like an antenna and pick up radio frequencies that get broadcast through your speaker. And sometimes we'd be in the middle of the church service and all of a sudden we'd hear truck drivers talking on their CBs coming over our sound system. We'd hear ambulances. We'd hear planes flying over. And I remember one Sabbath in particular, I was up there preaching and all of a sudden we heard the ambulance driver talking to the base station saying stuff that he would never have said if he knew it was being broadcast in a local church. <laughs> Heaven hears everything we say. He said, Elisha the prophet. Now you know how you say Elisha 
Elisha is very much like the name of Jesus. It's Elohim is Savior. Jesus' name is Yahweh is Savior. Elisha is like a type of Jesus in this story. You know, Luke chapter 12, verse 2 says, There is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetop. God has tried to teach me the hard way, which is how I learn most things. Um, you shouldn't talk about people. It's never right. I never feel good, but sometimes we all do a little bit of that. I won't ask you to raise your hands. <laughs> because on more than one occasion, I've been saying something that may not have been complimentary about somebody. I turn around, there they are. Ever do that with your parents? You're talking about them when you're a kid and they're listening? Yeah, and then there's swift and immediate retribution. So, the king of Israel comes up with an idea. He says, go and find out where he is. This is their secret weapon. I can't conquer the kingdom unless I get through Elisha because he's thwarting all of my plans. So, I'll go after him. Why did the devil go after Jesus? If the devil wants to destroy us, he's got to get through Christ. And so he focuses on the big problem in Israel was this single prophet. Now, in, in thinking about this, I can't help but wonder, out of the whole king of Israel, they had trained generals and captains and sergeants and soldiers. They had their champions and their men of valor. And, and the king of Syria is worried about the prophet. Are you a threat to the devil? You should be. Has God had people on earth that were a threat to the devil? When God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, just the name of Job just made the hackles go up on the back of Satan's neck. Oh, not Job. I haven't been able to get anywhere with Job. And Job was a threat to the devil. The apostle Paul was a threat to the devil, as were most of the apostles. And he gave him special attention. That's why Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. The devil knew that if Peter was thoroughly converted, he was such a, a, a good communicator. Of course, he was the spokesman there at Pentecost that the church would fly. Peter was a natural leader, and so he had to bring down Peter. Jesus said, Peter, I have especially prayed for you because you're a threat to the devil. You know, even before Peter denied Christ, Peter had been out preaching, and he'd met with great success. And so the devil was focusing on him. And Jesus says, I prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. You know, Paul was out traveling through Asia one time with Silas. And he, uh, he was casting out evil spirits. And there was this one man that was possessed by the devil. That was a special uh, problem. And there was a Jewish uh, priest named Sceva. He had seven sons. And they fancied themselves exorcists. They had heard, you know, that uh, there's a lot of problems with demonic activity. And they said, you know, for a price, we'll cast out devils. They said, well, there's this one man here. He's really filled with devils. And so the seven sons of Sceva went to cast the devils out of this man. And this was a genuinely demon-possessed man. And they said, well, you know, Paul is doing this with some success. And he's using the name of Jesus. And so without even knowing Jesus, these boys say to the devil, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, come out. <laughs> and the devil laughed at them and said, the demon-possessed man, he said, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know you. And he leapt on these young men and beat them up. And then, by the way, that's Acts 19, 15. Leapt on them, beat them up, and they all fled naked and wounded. But I always was struck by the thought that the devil said, I know Paul but I don't even know you. So which way do you want it? <laughs> You're probably going to think about your answer. Do you want the devil to know who you are? Don't you want to be living the kind of life where God says, have you considered my servant? Put your name in there. 
that you're living the kind of life that is a threat to the devil. But part of you is thinking, I don't know that I want any special attention from the devil. I'm already getting a hard time. So I'm sure if you're like me, you feel the kind of, that's like mixed. That's a trick question. Well, Elisha was a special threat because of his godliness and his relationship with the Lord. I, I hope we want that kind of relationship. The king naturally reasoned if he could capture Elisha, he could overcome the people. You know, even Christ quoted that scripture, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. So they went after the shepherd of the people. The devil was trying to attack the source of communication. The way that God was communicating with the king was through Elisha. How does God communicate with us? Through prayer. We pray in Christ's name. The devil knows that if he can cut off the lines of communication, you know, one of the first things that happened during the first Gulf War when the Allied forces went in to liberate Kuwait and they attacked Iraq, all those first bombers, they came in. They didn't bomb people. You know what they bombed? Those missiles took out their radar, took out their communication towers, took out their television stations, their radio stations. It cut off their communication. And that's one of the first things you do to weaken a kingdom. How do you think the devil weakens us? Cuts off our community. Gets us to neglect prayer. We're, we're in too big a hurry. Matter of fact, Karen and I this morning, here I'm the pastor, hurrying to go to church and teach everybody about God. And I'm running out the door. Karen came into the garage to put some potluck food in there and I thought, we haven't prayed together. And so standing there in the garage, we stopped and prayed. You know, we've got to pray together as a family. We got so busy doing the work of the Lord, we forgot to pray together. Oh, but I'm doing God's work, so it's okay if I neglect communication. No, we got to make sure the devil doesn't trick us with that old trap. So the king says, if we could just get Elisha, he said, go and see where he is. So they got these spies that are kind of roaming around. They're inquiring, where's Elisha? They said, surely he's in Dothan. Now, anyone know where Dothan appears another time in the Bible? When Joseph goes looking for his brothers, he ends up wandering. Dothan's not far from Shechem. It's up there in the middle of Israel. And he, he found them. It's a little town. It's got short walls just big enough to keep the cattle out and the cattle in. And the word Dothan means two wells. So the city, it was a nice little place. had two wells in it. But it was comparatively small. And as Elisha went on his circuit visiting the different parts of Israel to encourage people, you notice he, he would go visit the different schools of the prophets. For this time being, he's in Dothan. You remember Elisha also, he would stay with the woman of Shunem. And he, she had an upper room she built for him. So he went on a circuit to encourage people. They never knew exactly where he was. And they said, well, he's at Dothan right now. Therefore, in the king of Syria, he sent horses and chariots with a great army. Now, usually chariots, that's like you're taking out the tanks. Horses and chariots and a great army for this one unarmed prophet. Reminds me of when King Herod went to arrest Peter with 16 soldiers. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. We've got him now. No way of escape. He's surrounded. Now, it would seem to me that the king of Israel or the king of Syria would realize if Elisha knows what things I say in my bedchamber, he's going to know about this plan too. So what good is it going to be? You know, the devil knows that the way to get to God's people is he's got to go through Jesus. And so the king says, I've got to get Elisha. That's why the devil wanted to kill Jesus. He thought, if I can get Christ to bow down to me, then I'll have the world. You know, the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And Christ has warned us, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So, during the night, the king of Syria with his, it's his great army, probably wasn't his whole force, but it's significant. He's got chariots and horses. He's got a big enough army to surround the city. And maybe the dogs were barking early in the morning. They heard all the horses out there kind of snorting. They're the first to know. And the servant of Elisha, now he's got a new servant because you remember in chapter 5, Gehazi was strict with leprosy. Now we're in chapter 6 of 2 Kings. 
So this young man, he, he doesn't maybe have the same kind of faith. He wakes up and he says, okay, well, it's probably time to get up and go draw some water from one of the wells. And, and he goes out and the sun is just beginning to illuminate the sky and he sees the glint of something shining and then he realizes as his eyes adjust and he hears the horses and the, the murmuring of the men that the city is surrounded by an army. And his heart seizes him with fear and he drops his bucket there at the well and he runs inside and shakes and wakes Elisha. Says, Master, alas, what will we do? And Elisha gets up like Jesus when he was woke in the storm and he yawns and stretches and doesn't look at all worried. And he walks to the window and he looks out and he sees the, the soldiers out there and he says, the young man says, come on, let me get, let's get a better view. And they walk out on the roof and there from the roof he can see the uh, Syrian army all around the city. And the young man says, what will we do? What will we do? So he said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if there was one thing that you could remember today, I think that'd be a great part of the sermon to remember. That when you are afraid and you think that the problems are too big or that you are outnumbered or there's no way of escape or there are no solutions, does the Lord want us to live in fear? How many times does Jesus say, do not be afraid? There in the storm, the disciples woke up, Jesus, and they said, we're afraid, we're dying. And, and he said, where is your faith? Why are you so afraid? Fear not, fear not, fear not. I am with you, God said. When you go through the water, I'm with you. When you go through the fire, I'm with you. When you go through the lion's den, I'm with you. Through the Red Sea, through the Jordan. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. But we forget that we don't need to be afraid. If we are walking with Christ, you know that you and Jesus are always the majority. You don't ever have to be afraid. He said, don't fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, Elisha at this point, is he concerned about the Syrian army or is he concerned about the faith of his servant? Elisha wants to disciple his servant the same way that Elijah discipled Elisha. He says, I want to build faith in him. This is, <laughs> this is what they would call a teachable moment. That was a great teachable moment. So one of the first things that Elisha's thinking about is here's this crisis. I'm going to show him I'm not afraid because I walked with Elijah. And I know from being with Elijah that when God pulled aside the veil, I saw chariots and horses of fire around Elijah. That if you're with Elijah, you have nothing to be afraid of. And he said, I need to teach you that if you're with God, you have nothing to be afraid of. Has God ever said to you, why are you afraid? You know, I first heard uh, an Indian pastor on the reservation preach this and uh, in the Navajo reservation. And he said, he said, God is on his throne. We don't need to worry. And for the first time, that picture came to me and I thought, you know, sometimes I thought in my mind that God was somehow up in heaven and there's this problem on earth and God is wringing his hands and worried and the veins are standing out in his forehead and he's thinking, oh no, what will I do? Have you, do you ever think God's worried? Is God ever worried about anything? No. Then if we're abiding in Christ, how worried should we be? No, we, we don't need to worry. God is still on his throne and if we turn to him with our problems, he can deal with them. And Elisha said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Hence the title for the sermon. Now, Elisha doesn't say open my eyes. He didn't need his eyes open. You know, Jesus said to Thomas, you believe because you've seen. He said, I won't believe unless I see the nail prints in his hands and the scar in his side, unless I thrust my hand in the scar in his side. Which is very, you know, some of you are from Missouri, right? You just, you need to see. You got to be, you need the evidence. Elisha didn't say, open my eyes. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. But sometimes we need some encouragement. And he said, Lord, he needs, he needs a lesson. Open his eyes. And behold, the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full 
of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Does Jesus ever have anything to be afraid of? When the disciples pulled out their sword, remember they came to arrest Jesus. Peter pulled out his sword and he went and Peter was a pretty good fisherman but he wasn't much of a soldier and he went to cut off the head of Malchus and all he got was his ear. And Jesus healed the ear of Malchus and he said, Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And he added, do you not know that I can now pray my father and he'll send more than 12 legions of angels? Bible promises the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Do we need to be afraid of the last days? Psalm 27.3, Though a host, an army, should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Well, this is very literal. A host was camping against them. David said, you don't need to be afraid. Psalm 3.6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves round about me. There are plenty of promises that were written before this event that young man could have known. You don't have to be afraid. And then, of course, Psalm 91. He'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Now, are they there today? Are they there right now? When Adam and Eve were first created, they were clothed with garments of light. Adam and Eve could talk to angels the way you and I are talking to each other. Matter of fact, their vision was better. We right now are confined to the three dimensions that we operate in, but Adam and Eve had complete access to that fourth dimension we called the spirit realm. We can't see. It's easier for us now to believe in that because there were probably 6,000 years of human history. You never could have convinced a person that sound could go through the air that TV pictures could go through the air. Right now, you and I know, most of us believe, that radio frequencies and x-rays and all kinds of things are going through the air. Matter of fact, we believe it so much, some are afraid we're going to get cancer from it. But we know that words can go through air, that you can't see them, but they're there. We know that TV pictures somehow can go through the air. Why do we find it hard to believe that there's another dimension scientists haven't yet discovered a spiritual realm that's very real and that there are angels in this room? Hopefully more good than bad. <laughs> there's probably a few bad angels. The Bible says there's two times as many good angels and I think the good angels are stronger than the bad angels because they're vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> I can't prove that. <laughs> but... Uh, they do eat angel's food cake. <laughs> so we don't need to be afraid, but they're there. They're real. So if you know that you've got God angels around you, you, you know, you've probably read some of the, the wonderful testimonies of uh, Ellen White gives how at times when there was a crisis, her eyes were open and she saw angels. Sometimes the angels were seen right by her visually and giving her messages that uh, she should share. But we need to remember that reality that God has his angels there. You know, a uh, flounder and a halibut fish, when they're born, like most fish, they got a, an eye on each side. But something happens at, before they turn a, a year of age, they go through a metamorphosis where suddenly they're swimming like most fish, you know, uh, what do you call it, vertically. And then all of a sudden one day they go, and they start swimming flat. And about that same time, something happens, and the eye on one side of the flounder, the bottom eye that's looking at the bottom, migrates around. And talk about evolution happening quickly. Eye goes from that side to this eye. And so the fishermen call it the blind side of the fish. Is the side that looks down. And if we spend our lives looking down, we're blind. We need to be looking up and living in a reality of things that are not seen but are very real. He said, Lord, open his eyes. So his eyes were open and he felt much better. Now Elisha walks out of the gates of the city, says the Syrians came down to him. I'm in 2 Kings 6.18. And they think they're getting ready to put him in handcuffs and Elisha prays again. And Elisha prays and says, Lord, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. 
and he struck them with blindness according to the word of the Lord. So now the whole army goes blind. And I don't know if they just got confused and they couldn't figure out why they were there or if they physically went blind, but now they can't see anything. Whole army struck blind. Now Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. Well, here you have a case of someone who can see leading the blind army. And so Elisha says to him, I, you're not looking for me. You're only looking for me because you're really trying to get the king. <laughs> Here's a picture of the whole army struck blind. And uh, by the way, you know, there's other times in the Bible where godly people prayed that someone would go blind. I know you always think that the saved are going to pray that people get their sight. But sometimes you've got to pray a person's blinded temporarily. And this is what Paul did in Acts 13, 9. Saul, who was also called Paul. Matter of fact, this is the story where Paul's name goes from Saul to Paul. He goes where uh, originally Barnabas was the chief spokesman. This is the time where Paul finally speaks up and he becomes the spokesman. Acts 13, 9. Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looks intently at this sorcerer who is trying to dissuade someone from accepting Jesus, a guy named Sergius Paulus. And he says to the sorcerer, O oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. It's like Paul is talking to the devil in the man, not just the man. How long will you not cease to pervert the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. Now why did Paul say, Lord, strike him with blindness? To bring him to repentance so maybe he would see the Lord. Why would Paul in particular pray that prayer? Was Paul once struck blind? Paul thought, I have great spiritual truth. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees and I'm going to go kill off all those Christians and on the road to Damascus, God said, you have no idea what you're doing. You are spiritually blind. And God struck him blind to illustrate that. Paul prayed and his sight was restored. So Paul was converted as a result of losing his sight then he got it back. Now Paul is praying for the same thing to happen to this false teacher. Not that he'd be permanently blinded, but that he'd be blinded long enough to know that he was blind. Nothing's more dangerous than a blind person who thinks they can see. I'm talking about a spiritually blind person who thinks they can see. And he prayed, the whole army goes blind. And then he says to the king, he said, you're not really looking for me. <laughs> he said, this is not the way, nor this is the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man who you seek. You always say following Elisha, right? Now this must have been a sight. When I get to heaven and they say, is there any particular DVD of Earth's history you'd like to withdraw and look at? This is one I would like to take off the shelf. Uh, here you've got Elisha. He hooks his finger in the bridle of the lead horse and he starts walking down the road between Dothan and Samaria with an army in tow. And all these Syrian soldiers are on their horses and they're just totally confused about where they're going. Uh, wouldn't that have been something? And as the guards are up on the walls of Syria, they see dust in the distance and uh, they're wondering what's going on. And they say, there's an army coming. Lock the gates. Get everyone, get your spears. Prepare for battle. And they said, yeah, it looks like the Syrian army's coming. But says, they don't look like they're in a war formation. They're just walking down the road. And, and if we're not mistaken, it looks like Elisha's leading them. And all the Hebrew soldiers gather on the walls of Samaria and they're looking at this very bizarre sight of Elisha and his servant who's really having a good time now. And he sees the prophet leading the army and he comes within the gates and he yells up to the king of Israel, open the gates. The king doesn't argue. They, they don't look like they're, they have no arrows in their bows and they're not ready for battle. They open the gates and into the capital city of the northern kingdom they lead this army and they bring them all in and they shut the gates and they're there in the central courtyard of the city and then Elisha prays you know that prime moment he says now Lord open the eyes of these men that they may see you know it's only being led by Elisha after being led by Elisha that they could really see it's only by following Jesus that we ultimately see and the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were inside Samaria. You know this is a great, great story because here the surrounders became the surrounded. 
they came to surround Dothan, and the eyes of Elisha's servant are open. He says, oh, the chariots and horses of God are surrounding you. And then the soldiers are led inside Samaria. They originally thought, we've got them where we want them. Now their eyes are open. They're going, wow, talk about turning the tables. Now they are in the city. The king of Israel, who they've been trying to trap, has surrounded them. And, oh, that, that's, that must have been a great scene. They, finally, when they got their wits about them, and all the, the Hebrew soldiers are up on the walls and on the roofs, and they get their spears ready to launch, and their arrows ready to fly, and they're just waiting. You know, the little laser beams are on their, their targets, and they're just ready for the word. And the king looks to Elisha and says, Shall I smite them now? Shall I smite them now? Just give the word. Ready, aim, say it. Fire. And Elisha says, No. You're not going to smite them. You've captured them. You've captured them all alive. You captured them without firing an arrow. So often battles in the Bible, God gave deliverance and he says, you won't even have to fire an arrow. Because the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him. And what did he say? You, you, people think the gospel's not in the Old Testament. It certainly is. Elisha said, set food and water before them that they may go to their master. You know, the teaching of the Bible is you overcome evil with good. Feed them. Give them something to eat. Show them love. Show them that they have been pursuing you. You have not been pursuing them. You ever have an enemy you want to get even with? You need to kill them with kindness. You don't get anywhere fighting evil with evil. I think it was Gandhi that said if the whole world lives by the principle of an eye for an eye, he said, soon the whole world is blind. The way you conquer evil is with kindness. He said, give them food. They're probably hungry. Give them water. Send them home. Show them that you're not waging war against them. They're waging war against you, and it's unprovoked. So they made a big provision, a big feast. You know, Proverbs says this, Solomon said, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For so he will heap coals of fire on his head. That's not saying that in doing this you're going to, <laughs> I'm going to burn them up. It means their conscience is going to smite them. And they're going to go, oh man, they're being so good to me and I'm being so bad to them. Some of you might need to practice that overcome evil with good in your families. You've got somebody that's been giving you a hard time. Are you looking for a good way to get even? Someone says something that's mean and you say, I've got a good comeback. That's, I got to fight that all the time because, you know, I can think of a clever comeback and, and uh, do a gotcha, but that's not what Jesus would do. You don't overcome evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. Romans repeats what Proverbs says in Romans 12, 20, and that's where Paul says in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Here Elisha's doing that in the Old Testament. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You know, this to me is one of the hardest places to be a Christian, is to love those that hate you. To be kind to those that take advantage of you. You've got stories, I've got stories of people that have done maybe very mean things. And it's hard to pray that God will love and bless them. But isn't that what we should pray for their ultimate conversion? That you might be the sons of your Father in heaven. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Remember hearing a story about this old Scotsman that had just a mortal enemy he just hated. He could not forgive. His name was McClintock. McClintock's the old Scotsman. And he could just spend all his time brooding, thinking of ways to get even with his enemy. That, uh, you know, it was like a long-standing feud that had happened with his neighbor in town. And one day the angel appeared to him, said, I've got good news, McClintock. He said, anything you ask now, I will give you. He said, but just know that whatever you ask for, I will give twice as much to your enemy. You ask for a pot of gold, I will give it to you, but your enemy will get two pots of gold. You ask for a new horse, I will give him two new horses. You ask for a home with ten rooms, 
he gets a home with 20 rooms. <sighs> that bothered him so much. He was wringing his hands and anxious and stewing about, I, don't want, I want to ask for, I don't want him to get it. And he just could not forgive and finally said, ah, I want you to strike me blind in one eye. <laughs> Some people just never get it. Proverbs 24, 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Peter says, 1 Peter 3, 9, nor returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you might inherit a blessing. If you are good to those that are unkind to you, who will win in the end? God will bless you in the end. He'll bless you with peace for one thing. Because when you're always thinking, <laughs> bitterness and revenge is like an acid that corrodes the container that holds it. If you have unforgiveness that you are nurturing in your heart, it is corroding you. So one of the first blessings that comes when you learn to forgive and do good to those that say, look, this is their problem. I'm not going to feel about them the way they feel about me. You'll receive a blessing. And the wonderful thing would be if they're converted in the process. Someone said, make it a habit of getting even with people, especially the ones who help you. It says, so he prepared a great feast for them. And they ate and they drank. And he sent them away and they went to their master. Notice this part. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. What do you know? Here the story starts. They're just going after the king of Israel time and time again. They're relentless. They will not give up. How did they finally stop the onslaught? Love them. Do something good for them. Show them kindness is the way to get even. And now, how did Jesus overcome the evil in this world? He overcame evil with good. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to love him before he started loving us. While we were his enemies, he showed love for us and died for our sins. Why? That the love of God might melt our hearts and that we could learn to love him in return. That's what the story of the gospel is. Being a Christian is really about a new point of view. I love this story. It talks about opening eyes, closing eyes, opening eyes. I'm glad it ends with eyes being opened. We need to pray God will open our eyes and help us to spend our time looking up and thinking about the eternal realities, not becoming distracted by fixing our attention here. The Bible says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, this is Hebrews chapter 12, endured the cross despising the shame that we might be saved. That's the one we ought to fix our eyes on. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen and be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want and most important, to share it with others. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Through radio, television, print, evangelistic events, and the Internet, Amazing Facts International is heeding the call of Jesus to go into all the world. Millions of individuals in over 150 countries have been blessed by the Word of God. Amazing Facts has spawned new spheres of influence in India, Africa, China, and Indonesia. With each new country come hundreds of translated booklets, study guides, and video presentations produced in each region for the people of that region. Armed with these precious truths, gospel workers are empowered to spread bright rays of light on every path they travel. Please visit give.amazingfacts.org to learn more about Amazing Facts International and how you can participate in this exciting soul-winning ministry. That website again is give.amazingfacts.org. Thank you for your support. We're here in Ponce, Puerto Rico, in an iguana park, surrounded by 
Big lizards or small dinosaurs, depends on how you look at it. These magnificent creatures are found mostly in Mexico, Central America, and South America, and the Caribbean islands. Here's a few amazing facts about iguanas. Iguanas come in a great spectrum of colors. They can be brown, green, blue, and their skin will often work as camouflage, allowing them to hide in the jungle. They're social creatures who like to eat together. And what's really interesting, even though they look fierce, iguanas are vegan vegetarians. They're regarded as popular pets, though if they're not cared for, they can actually just stop eating and will themselves to die. Typically, iguanas just lay eggs and they abandon their offspring. So those little iguanas have to fend for themselves from the time they're born. If they're attacked, they'll fight with their tail, either punching or whipping their opponent. It's interesting to see a dog running for mercy after being whipped by an iguana. Also, to ensure a fast escape, they can detach their tail and later grow another one. Iguanas generally like to live around water, and they can swim away escaping from predators. Green iguanas in particular are excellent swimmers. They have the ability to inflate themselves and swim incredible distances. This is one way they've been able to populate the different islands of the Caribbean. What's incredible is these creatures have lungs where they're able to hold their breath for up to 28 minutes, putting even a crocodile to shame. They also know how to compensate for when things get hot or cold. They can regulate their body temperature using the loose flaps of skin they have under their throats and under their legs. You might even say an iguana has ESP because God made them with sort of a third eye on top of their head. They can't really see with it, but it's a photoreceptor that helps them to regulate their body's circadian rhythms. You know, in the same way that God made iguanas where they're some of the toughest creatures in God's natural kingdom, Christians need to learn to be resilient in the spiritual realm. Through God's grace, we can learn to be great survivors. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I think, friends, we all know sometimes life can be tough. We feel like we're being beaten and pressed on every side. Sometimes there's health problems, relationship problems, financial reverses. But in the same way God made the iguana resilient, God can help you to bounce back. Jesus said that through his help, we can be overcomers and we are able to endure. If you turn to him and ask him for his help and his spirit, he will recreate you and make you even tougher than an iguana. Wouldn't you like to ask him now? Don't forget to request today's free offer. It's sure to be a blessing. And thank you for your continued support as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We hope you'll join us next week as we delve deep into the Word of God to explore more amazing facts.